السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ کی اور راہ میں پیس اینڈ بلیسنگ آف گاڈ آلمیٹی بی اپون یو آل ویلکم ٹو این ادر لائیو ایڈیشن آف وی آر ون سو وی آر اسٹارٹنگ تلاوت قرآن من الشیت نرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم تلک الرسل فدلنا بعدہم وعلا بعد منہم كلم الله ورفع بعضهم درجات وآتينا عيسى ابن مريم البينات وأيدناه بروح القدس These messengers have we exalted some of them above others among them There are those to whom Allah spoke, and some of them He exalted by degrees of rank. And we gave Jesus, son of Mary, clear proofs, and strengthened him, and strengthened him with the spirit of holiness. Can I change my HelloFresh delivery? Yes, easy. I can adjust my box delivery with just a few... وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مَا قَتَلَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمْ الْبَيِّنَاتُ وَلَكِنْ اخْتَلَفُوا فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ آمَنْ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ آمَنَ وَمِنْهُمْ كفر ولو شاء الله ما قتلوا ولكن الله يفعل ما يريد And if Allah had so willed Those that came after them would not have fought with one another after clear signs had come to them, but they did disagree. Of them were some who believed, and of them were some who disbelieved, and if Allah had so willed, they would not have fought with one another. But Allah does what He desires. يا أيها الذين آمنوا أنفقوا مما رزقناكم من قبل أن يأتي يوم أن يأتي يوم لا بيع فيه ولا خلة ولا شفاع والكافرون هم الظالمون O oh, ye who believe, spend out of what we have bestowed on you Before the day comes, wherein there shall be no buying and selling, nor friendship, nor intercession, and it is those who disbelieve that do wrong to themselves. Allah, la ilaha illa 
الحيل قيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم الله there is no God but he the living the self-subsisting and all-sustaining. Slumber seizes him not, nor sleep. To him belongs whatsoever is in the heavens and whatsoever is in the earth. Who is he that will intercede with him except by his permission? <laughs> He knows what is before them and what is behind them and they encompass nothing of his knowledge except what he pleases. His knowledge extends over the heavens and the earth and the care of them burdens him not and he is the high, the great. لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي فمن يكفر بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك بالعروة الأثقى لانفصام لها والله سميع عليم. There should be no compulsion in religion. Surely, right has become distinct from wrong. So whosoever refuses to be led by those who transgress and believes in Allah has surely grasped a strong handle which knows no breaking. And Allah is all hearing. All knowing. <laughs> Allah is the friend of those who believe. He brings them out of every kind of darkness into light. And those who disbelieve, their friends are the transgressors who bring them out of light into every kind of darkness. These are the inmates of the fire. Therein shall they abide. 
ألم تر إلى الذي حاج إبراهيم في ربه أن آتاه الله الملك إذ قال إبراهيم ربي الذي يحيي ويميت قال أنا أحيي وأميت Hast thou not heard of him who disputed with Abraham about his Lord because Allah had given him kingdom? If you can't manifest abundance, there are three simple reasons why not. I see so many people getting this wrong. When Abraham said, My Lord is he who gives life and causes death. He said, I also give life and cause death. <laughs> Now we start a short video about the Holy Quran. आओ लोगों के यही नूर खुदा पाओगे अस्सलाम वालेकुम वरहमतुल्लाहि व बरकातहू वेलकम टू आवर प्रोग्राम एसेंस ऑफ इस्लाम इफ वी लुक एट आवर सोसाइटी टुडे वी सी दैट मेनी पीपल आर मूविंग अवे फ्रॉम रिलीजन एथियिज्म इज ऑन द राइज and Islam, unfortunately, is no exception. Many Muslims, they do not understand the teachings of Islam, especially the youth. They do not understand the importance of those teachings. They do not understand how they can apply those teachings in their lives. Fortunately, we are that community who has accepted the Messiah of the age. He wrote many books, over 80 books, explaining the essence of those teachings of Islam. They have been put together in a volume, five volume series, it's called Essence of Islam. Whichever teaching of Islam we do not understand, we can pick up any volume and try to understand through the writings of the Promised Messiah what that teaching actually means and how we can apply that in our lives. Today we are going to speak about the Holy Quran. In the studio, I have with me Hanan Sobi Saab and Asif Khan Saab. Jazakallah for joining us. Uh, welcome to our program. So, Asif Saab, uh, let's start with you. That when we are talking about the Holy Quran, we say all the religions, they have a Holy Scripture. So, what is different between the Scripture of the Muslims, the Holy Quran, and the other Scriptures that other religions have to offer? Essentially, what is the Holy Quran? Yes. So, in regards to the question, the most unique aspect of the Holy Quran is that it is the revealed Word of God, verbatim letter for letter, word for word. Now this is something which is very unique when it comes to religious scriptures. This is a, th these are the words which were revealed to the Holy Prophet Wasallam from Allah Ta'ala Himself. So we have to remember that these aren't stories that were made up by followers who, came, who appeared later on or even followers of that same time. They're not even the words of the Prophet, the founder of Islam, rather they're the exact words of God. Yeah, and I think uh, this point, you know, sometimes it's a small statement, but it's overlooked. That the rest of the scriptures, uh, they are inspired scriptures. Yeah. You know, they are scriptures that, okay, the prophet wrote, but they include the words of the prophet. They're not verbatim, as you mentioned, that they're not word for word. Uh, they're revelation of God Almighty. In that sense, as you mentioned, the Holy Quran definitely is unique. But Hanan Sobi Saab, you know, as Asif Saab mentioned, that this is the revelation of God Almighty. And we know from history that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu he didn't know how to read and write. So if he was receiving that revelation, one might ask that this man, the Prophet of Islam, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu he himself didn't know how to read and write. 
So that revelation when he received, how did that get transformed into a, you know, a book format which we have today? How was the Holy Quran compiled? Um, the Holy Quran, we have to understand, it wasn't sent down altogether, uh, you know, in one book form. Mm -hmm. It was sent down in piecemeal, you know, um, verse by verse, perhaps a section by section, uh, s slowly, slowly, over a span of 23 years. That was the time frame uh, of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's prophethood. prophethood. With, during the whole duration of his prophethood, he was receiving this revelation, the revelation of the Holy Quran. And we know, for example, the very first revelation, uh, Ikra Bismi Rabbika Lazi Khalak, that verse of the Quran comes closer to the end. It's in the 96th chapter of the Holy Quran in Surah Alaq. Mm -hmm. That is towards the end of the Holy Quran. Even so the, though it was the first. Even though it's the very first verse which was being revealed. So not only for the compilation of the Holy Quran was the, were the words of the Quran revealed, but also the placement of, the, uh, of those verses within the Holy Quran, where they're going to come. That was also part of the revelation. The so he was told by God Almighty that right. this revelation belongs to this chapter. And it's this verse. Exactly. So a specific verse for a specific, you know, something that happened in his life or something that happened in the life of his companions mm -hmm. that required that instruction or that teaching from God the Almighty. Mm -hmm. And then even where that should be placed within uh, the, the whole framework of the Quran, where it should come, was also revealed to him. From very early on, we know uh, from the Hadith and from the, from the history that the Quran was being written down right away whether it was on, on hide or on bone or on parchments of paper if they could find it. But very early on, there were qatib vihi there were those who were assigned by the Prophet ﷺ to be the writers, to be the writers of that revelation. For example, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali, Razi Talanho, all of these companions, they were, not, they, they were his closest companions as well as being amongst the writers of the Holy Quran. So the Holy Prophet ﷺ himself didn't know how to read and write, right. but other companions who knew... They were commissioned to do so. They were commissioned, to, as soon as the revelation was coming, they were they writing were, it. And we know this because, for example, um, you know, Hazrat Usman, Razi Talanho, at the time of his martyrdom, during his Khilafat, mm -hmm. uh, we know he was reciting the Holy Quran. Yeah. And uh, in, in there it is stated that when his attacker attacked him, when he was being martyred, when he attacked him, he put up his right hand to you know, stop the attack mm -hmm. and his fingers were cut. And then Hazrat Usman Razilatalan, who at that moment told his attacker that you have just cut that hand, which was the very first one, to write the verses of the Holy Quran. And Hazrat Usman Razila who of course was amongst the very first companions of the Prophet So this is how we know that from very early on it was being written down, it was being compiled, it was being told to them where to put those verses and all of this was being done within the, during the lifetime, during the prophethood of the Prophet And again, uh, you know, this is a, a very important point to understand that though the Holy Prophet himself didn't know how to read and write, many of his companions knew how to read and write and as you mentioned that the specific order it was also being revealed along with the revelation yes. that God Almighty was telling him where this verse uh, is to go in which chapter after which verse uh, out of that. Not just that, if you take for example during Ramadan mm -hmm. when uh, the angel Gabriel would come and review the whole of the Quran that was revealed up until that moment. So it was revealed, you know, in a span of 23 years. That means in those 23 years, some verses were revealed 23 times because mm -hmm. the angel Gabriel is coming and reviewing and revealing those verses again. Okay. Right. So even the order, the exact verses, once they had been revealed within that year, how much ever had been revealed was reviewed again. Mm -hmm. So we can say at least because in, in the last year of his life, the Holy Prophet so was, uh, was revealed it twice. Angel Gabriel revealed the whole of the Quran in the month of Ramadan twice as a way to denote that now the Quranic revelation is coming to an end. So we can say at least twice each verse had been revealed. Jazakallah yeah. Hanan sir for this explanation. Uh, Asif sir, now we have understood uh, what the Holy Quran is and as you mentioned is the verbatim revelation of God Almighty and Hanan sir explained to us that though the Holy Prophet himself didn't know how to read and write, uh, there were other companions who were uh, assisting with the writing of the Holy Quran and it was being written down uh, at the same time. Now when we think about the Holy Quran as a book, you know, what is the purpose of the Holy Quran? 
Because essentially whatever we have, you know, at home all of us have different books. You know, we have a purpose in mind when we buy a book. So somebody who is picking up the Holy Quran, or if we're telling somebody to pick up the Holy Quran, what interest would they have in, you know, having that or picking up the Holy Quran and reading it? So the purpose of the Holy Quran is essentially the purpose of religion. The purpose of your religion is for you to find your Creator and to make a strong connection with your Creator. Mm -hmm. And that is what the Holy Quran facilitates actually. You know, in, in essence, the Holy Quran, without it, you cannot reach that stage of certainty in regards to the existence of God. As a Muslim of Islam, he explains sin as a certainty. Mm -hmm. And he likens it to iron. And he states that iron can only be broken with iron. You can't use another flimsy material to, and attempt to break iron with it. Yeah. So how can you possibly think that you can stay away from sin and go about finding your creator on the notion that a creator should exist? Mm -hmm. that's, the first, that, that, that's the first statement which has a Muslim of Islam makes. So what we understand from this is that the Holy Quran is that book which takes you to that level of certainty and shows you that Allah Ta'ala truly does exist. He actually is there. And with that level of certainty, you can now eschew sin. Mm -hmm. So that's essentially the purpose of the Holy Quran. Uh, basically the purpose now is to go and find Allah Ta'ala. And the Holy Quran facilitates that and proves the existence of God. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, uh, this is a very, uh, again, uh, important question to understand that our purpose has been uh, you know, defined by God Almighty since He created us. Mm -hmm. And that purpose is to worship God Almighty. Yes. And the Holy Quran, as you mentioned, you know, tells us how we can find God and how we can have that relationship with God Almighty. Uh, and Ansab, if we keep that in mind, the uh, Holy Quran, uh, how it was compiled, uh, as you were talking about it earlier, uh, one question arises that, you know, if the purpose is to have a relationship with God Almighty, you know, I want to do it as fast as possible, right? And there are many commandments in the Holy Quran. But we see, as you just mentioned, that they weren't all revealed at once. So if the purpose is for me to have, through the Holy Quran, a communion, a relationship with God Almighty, so why did it take 23 years? I mean, 23 years is a long time, if we think about it. So why wasn't it all <coughs> revealed at once? It wasn't revealed of the promised Messiah in the essence of Islam. Actually, he has given the answer to this very question, why the Holy Quran was not revealed altogether at once. And he gives the answer that it was one reason is for the sake of the satisfaction of the heart of the Holy Prophet You see, had it been revealed all at once, that was the end of the communion with God? Yeah. Of course not. It was revealed so that throughout his prophethood, throughout the, his day-to-day -day life, every day, he is having that connection with God the Almighty, that communion with God the Almighty, despite all the trials and the tribulations and all the forces which are against him. The satisfaction that Allah Ta'ala is providing him with that continuous connection, with that continuous communion with him, is, is something that only the Prophet Sallallahu could understand. At that moment of time when, you know, he, he needs God to be there. Everything is against him and Allah Ta'ala is saying, no, you are on the right path and you are, you are taking these people to the right path. Mm -hmm. So it's for his own satisfaction. The other reason is that had it been revealed all together at once, then the difficulty in uh, administering those uh, teachings, the difficulty in following those teachings for his followers it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. Hazrat Aisha Razila Talanha, she gives the example that had the teachings of, um, uh, against alcohol and had the teachings against fornication. If these were, had, if, if they had been given all together all at once, then many people, they would not have been able to follow those teachings. They would not have been able to accept Islam as such. So these teachings came slowly, slowly, and it created the, the society in a way that they are able to follow those teachings. They are able to get to the position that they, are, uh, they can follow those teachings that Allah Ta'ala is, is, so is giving. They were, first they were being conditioned exactly. through the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and once a certain, they had reached a certain level, the teachings were being revealed according to that level they had advanced. Uh, and I think we'll continue with this topic, uh, with the same question. Uh, it's time for a quick break. Uh, please stay with us. Uh, we'll be back after this short break. I call to Allah to witness that the Holy Qur'an is a rare pearl. Its outside is light, and its inside is light, and its above is light, and its below is light. And there is light in every word of it, 
It is a spiritual garden whose clustered fruits are within easy reach and through which streams flow. Every fruit of good fortune is found in it and every torch is lit from it. Its light has penetrated to my heart and I could not have acquired it by any other means. And Allah is my witness that if there had been no Qur'an, I would have found no delight in life. I find it that its beauty exceeds that of a hundred thousand Josephs. I incline towards it with a great inclination and drink it into my heart. It has nurtured me as an embryo is nurtured and it has a wonderful effect on my heart. My self is lost in its beauty. It has been disclosed to me in a vision that the garden of holiness is irrigated by the water of the Holy Qur'an, which is a surging ocean of the water of life. He who drinks from it comes to life. Indeed, he brings others to life. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome back. Um, just before the break, we were talking about the Holy Quran being revealed in 23 years and why it wasn't revealed at once. So, Hanan Sab, let's continue with that. That you know, you were explaining uh, that how certain uh, commandments had they been revealed right in the beginning, it would have been extremely difficult for certain people uh, to accept those commandments and enter the fold of Islam. You can take it as an example of an infant. You know, early on, the infant starts by taking very small dosages of of its of its meals, of its uh, milk, of its food, and slowly, slowly, as it grows and it it progresses and it's able now to digest more, then it starts to up in its intake. Mm -hmm. The same goes here that the initial dosage, you can say, of the Holy Quran, because the society is now being prepared. It's being prepared for the final law for the Holy Quran so that the societies which are going to come after this, which are going to be the children of these society, they are going to have the perfect framework uh, to follow these teachings and to, to accept these teachings and to create that society. So this is why in the very beginning it was simple, you know, s uh, smaller examples, not just going all out together. For example, even the veil, it was revealed in, in Medina. It was revealed much later on. It wasn't, you're not coming into society and completely uh, changing all of the rules and all of the laws because that would create a chaos and that would create even, uh, already the Holy Prophet ﷺ was facing so much of a, of a backlash. Mm -hmm. I think another good example of this is also um, the teachings in regards to slavery. Yeah. Right. You know, um, um, actually in regards to the teachings of, of slavery, slavery wasn't abolished all at once yeah. in the religion of Islam. If we, if we, look, if we study the, the history of the, the religion of Islam, actually what we see is that initially the Holy Prophet wasallam taught kindness and love and compassion towards slaves. Mm -hmm. right? And gave them a, a, an elevated status in society compared to where they were before. And then another way, another um, uh, teaching of the Holy Quran is that certain punishments were to free your slaves. If you committed a certain sin, you were told to free your slaves. Yeah. Right? So, and, then, and then eventually down the road, slavery was completely abolished. Yeah. Right? So, now, so again, we see a gradual, a gradual increase or an, a, gradual, a gradual progression towards an end first, goal. First they had mm. to be seen as human beings yes. before they could even be mm. seen as equal human beings in yeah, the sight of God. I think this mm. is a, a prime example mm. of the uh, reason why the Holy Quran or the teachings of the Holy Quran were revealed slowly, mm. slowly. And I mean if we com compare this example of slavery against uh, what happened in America, mm. we still see the ripple effects of that. Yeah. That though slavery yeah, you was... See, you uh, see it today as well, and not only with slavery, you see, that you see it with alcohol as well. You know, the prohibition of alcohol that occurred in the United States was an epic failure. Yeah. If you actually study the background of it, yeah. it was a complete failure and it had to be reinstated. Exactly. And actually, it's actually only the religion of Islam which, has, which can successfully actually boast of this, yeah. that it actually pro prohibited alcoholism yeah. or the use of alcohol. Right. And, and exactly, the Hanansa, the point you were mentioning that the society slowly, slowly, it was brought to this level that when the commandment came for the prohibition of alcohol, it happened right away. Yeah. You know, yeah. with those companions, it is mentioned that they were sitting down and they were drinking actually at that time. And somebody came and said the Holy Prophet Sallallahu has mentioned that he has received a command, commandment regarding this. And uh, some companions said, okay, let us go verify. 
And the other companions, they're like, no, first we break these barrels, and then we will go verify. So even from that point of view, I mean, when we think about it, just this one injection, then imagine them sitting down drinking, but they were still able to have, through the Holy Prophet Wasallam, that change in themselves, that even in that state, they're say, able to say that, okay, first we must uh, obey the Holy Prophet Wasallam, uh, and then, you know, we'll continue this. So, and there are so many different examples. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad he, he talks about this even in his book, uh, Essence, uh, The Philosophy of the Teachings of Islam. It's also mentioned in Essence of Islam, that this was the purpose of the Holy Prophet Wasallam, and this is the purpose of Islam, that it, teaches, it takes you step by step, from a lower stage to a higher stage to a higher stage until you reach that final stage, you know, nafsa mutmainna, where now you're content, you're happy, uh, and you have a living communion, you have a living relationship uh, with God Almighty. Uh, Asr Sahib, in the beginning, when we spoke about the Holy Quran, um, we touched about, upon this, that the Holy Quran is the revealed word of God, yes. 100% verbatim. And we say that the other religions, uh, whether they be inspiration, thoughts, whatever that is, uh, and it has changed over time. So when we think about the Holy Quran, it's been 1400 years, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, when somebody thinks from that point of view, what can we say that is it still in its original format, whatever was revealed to the Holy Prophet ﷺ, and as Hanan Sahib explained uh, how it was compiled, is it still in that original format, or has it been changed, has it been corrupted as well? Well, the Holy Quran is still in its complete, original, pristine, pristine format. Now, the question arises, could it have been interpolated in the time of the Holy Prophet ﷺ? That's an impossibility, because the Prophet ﷺ was there and present in society. So if anything did occur, the changes would have been made. Mm -hmm. Now, the question arises, after the death of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, is it possible for it to have changed? Now, this is an impossibility, because we see that, we see that there were multiple copies of the Holy Quran which are written out by hand. Mm -hmm. Now, not only this, the Muslims were reciting the Holy Quran five times a day. As the Muslim of the explains that multiple tafasir were written in regards to the Holy Quran. Not only this, Muslim societies and, uh, and Muslim, uh, Muslim empires actually instated the Holy Quran and its teachings. Mm -hmm. So to think that the Holy Quran could have been interpolated, that's just wrong. It's just yeah, completely incorrect. I think, uh, There's yes. also, in fact, mm -hmm. even during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu we find in the Hadith that there, his companions, many of them, they had already began memorizing. Right. Yeah. Yes. They had begun, there were 70 Hufas, for example, in his lifetime, uh, which were sent to uh, a far-off tribe to teach them mm -hmm. Islam. For that very purpose, they were sent out. So they were the Hufas. They were the ones who had memorized the, all of the Holy Quran, whatever was revealed up until that moment. And it, it reminds me of an incident that once Hazrat Umar was, was offering his salat behind an Imam and that Imam happened to recite a verse of the Quran differently from the way he had, 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 had it memorized or had, had, had it known. And right away he took him to the court of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu to decide that matter, which one of us is correct and which one is, of us is incorrect. Mm -hmm. So there were all the, of these uh, fail-safes that were set in motion, that were there, so that there were, could not be any interpolation in the Quran. Yeah, and I think even, uh, if I remember correctly, I think a few months ago or maybe last year, uh, there was also a finding uh, in Britain in one of the museums, they found an old uh, scroll and it had certain words and uh, you know, it was really old, but it had same writing of the Holy Quran which is found today. So as you mentioned, there were many different fail safes and the Promised Messiah Islam, he mentions that the Holy Quran is the only scriptures in which we find this promise of God. Where Allah Ta'ala says that, Inna na nahnu nazalna zikra, that you know Allah Ta'ala says, I have sent down this uh, exhortation, this remembrance, uh, this Holy Quran, uh, and I'm also going to protect it. So this promise of God for the protection of the Holy Quran is also only found within the Holy Quran. No other scripture has this promise of God. Uh, so we see that it is the same book that was revealed to the Holy Prophet Wasallam. It was compiled uh, in his lifetime. It was written down. Uh, and uh, by the grace of God Almighty, we have that same book today uh, in its perfect and uh, pristine form. But Hanansa, keeping that in mind, we see this cycle that, you know, there are so many religions in the world, 
right? And over the course of our history, uh, the history of mankind, there have been so many religions, one after the other, one after the other. So keeping that in mind, the Holy Quran or the religion of Islam, um, should we say that this is the final law, the Holy Quran, the religion of Islam is the last religion and the word of God revealed to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu is the last word of God or can another law come after the Holy Quran? No, so as, as you just said that Allah, he says in the Quran that I have sent down this exhortation, I will be its protector and we see that protection from the day of its inception to now. Mm -hmm. and amongst the various ways in which Allah Ta'ala has done that uh, to show that this is the last law and that this is the final Sharia for the whole of the world he, uh, besides all the different ways of protecting the, the, the word of it but also the teachings of it because you know many people can take a different interpretation of the same words yeah. this is why we have so many different sects and so many uh, people within the same you know uh, Muslim Ummah following different things but the fact that Allah Ta'ala through his appointed reformers, through his appointed people, those who come in his name and say that we have received this revelation from God the Almighty and this is the meaning of this verse. These are the, this is the meaning of these teachings. So Hazrat Masimo he has also explained that from the, from the very beginning, of course, we have the Qur'an in its uh, pristine form, mm -hmm. but also its teachings have been protected by all of those mujaddideen, by all of those uh, the, you know, the friends of Allah who have come and have done that service for its protection, for its pristine teachings. I think to, uh, and just to add on to that, Allah Ta'ala Himself states in the Holy Quran, Al-Yawma Akmatu Lakum Deenakum Wa Atmamtu Alaykum Ni'mati Wa Raditu Lakum Al-Islam Adina Which means Allah Ta'ala has completed the, the religion which is the religion of Islam, which means that if it's completed, then what's the need for another religion? The question arises that, okay, if Allah Ta'ala were to send another religion, another book, another teaching, what was the need for it? Does the Holy Quran not cover those needs? The Holy Quran has clearly stated that every single need is covered mm -hmm. in the teachings of the Holy Quran. Allah Ta'ala has stated this, so there's no need for another law. And Zakala Hanan Sahib and uh, Asif Sahib for joining us today, we were speaking about the Holy Quran. Uh, and as you just heard that the Holy Quran is unique in the sense that there are two promises of God Almighty in the Holy Quran. One, which Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back. Uh, now we are listening uh, beautiful Nazam Jamal Husni Quran. Hai. Jamal Hussain Quran Noor Jaan Har Musalma Hai Kamar Hai Chand Auron Ka Hamara chand Qur'an hai Kamar hai chand auron ka Hamara chand Qur'an hai Nazir uski nahi jamti nazar mein fikr kar dekha Nazir uski I'm 
भला क्यों कर न हो यकता कला में पाक रहमा बाहर उसके हर इबारत में बाहर जावेदा पैदा है उसके हर इबारत में वो खूबी चमन में है न उस साको बुसता है न वो खूबी चमन में है न उस साको बुसता है कला में पाक यजदा का कोई सानी नहीं हर गिज अगर माँ है वगै लाले बदखशां है अगै लोलो अम्मा है वगै लाले बदखशां है कौन से कौन बश क्यों कर बराबर हो खुदा के कौन से कौन बश क्यों कर कुदरत यहाँ दरमानदगी फर के नुमाया है वहाँ कुदरत यहाँ दरमानदगी फर के हमारा चांद कुर है नो वी आर वॉचिंग वीडियो मॉडर्न डिस्कवरीज इन द लाइट ऑफ द होली कुरान اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فرج البصر هل ترى من فطور सुमर्ज इल बसरा कर रैने यन कलिब इल कल बसरो खास बहुवा हसीर 
No incongruity canst thou see in the creation of the gracious God. Then look again, seest thou any flaw? I look again, and yet again, thy sight will only return unto thee dazzled and fatigued. These verses from chapter 67 of the Holy Quran were recited at the beginning of a speech. That speech was given 37 years ago. The occasion was the Nobel Prize Banquet, 1979, in Stockholm, Sweden. And the speaker, of course, was Professor Dr. Abdus Salam, who had just been honored with the Nobel Prize in Physics. And after reciting these verses, Professor Salam said, and I quote, this, in effect, is the faith of all physicists. The deeper we seek, the more is our wonder excited, and the more is the dazzlement for our gaze, unquote. Dazzlement for our gaze. A beautiful description in Surah Mulk, captured by the first Nobel Prize winner on the grandest stage of science to describe his moment of discovery was and still is today a powerful, powerful reminder of the majesty of the perfect miracle we know as the Holy Quran. Respected chairman and my dear and distinguished guest of the Promised Messiah salam, today I will present modern discoveries in light of the Holy Quran, discoveries which have dazzled truth seekers over the ages, which have convinced skeptics, and as I hope to convince you today, have taken some on a remarkable journey towards Islam. And allow me to begin with the story of one such journey. The journey begins in 1852. A boy is born in the village of Worcestershire, England, and his name is Clement. At the age of five, both of Clement's parents pass away, and he is raised by his grandmother. And at a very young age, Clement developed a fascination for the sciences, for astronomy in particular. And this passion would continue into his adulthood and it would take him on a journey, a journey around the world to seek the truth. So remember the name, Clement, as I will be returning to his story in a moment. So the Holy Quran, we believe, is a perfect book. In his Allah Oham, Hazrat Akhtas Masih Ma'ud alayhi salatu wasalam, described the Quran as an unlimited treasury of insights, verities, and wisdoms, which are expounded in every age. But before I get into some of the examples of this wisdom, we should ask ourselves a general question about persuasion and prediction. How can a skeptic be convinced that a discovery made, or discovery is a fulfillment of a prediction made long ago? It is not surprising that atheists have presented criteria to check the genuineness of a prophecy. For example, Doug Kruger in his book, What is Atheism, lists some of these criteria. For example, he says the prophecy must be clear and unique. The prophecy must be of an unlikely event. It must not be the result of an educated guess. And the event which fulfills the prophecy mustn't be staged or manipulated. So let us apply these criteria and let us apply it to a simple example from the Holy Quran. Allah Ta'ala says in chapter 15, verse 10, Inna nahnu nazal nazikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. Verily, we ourselves have sent down this exhortation, and most surely we will be its guardian. So based on this verse, as we all know, Muslims believe the Quran is unchanged from its original revelation 14 centuries ago. But skeptics for years have questioned this claim. But a discovery made only last year has proven this prophecy to be true. Carbon dating technology at Oxford University has shown that fragments of the Holy Quran found at the University of Birmingham in England in 2015 are dated from the time of the Holy Prophet wasallam, proving that the contents of the Quranic text have indeed been preserved. So by this example, we have a prophecy that is clear, unique, made well before its fulfillment, not based on an educated guess and unstaged, fitting all of those criteria. So this demonstrates that even by the yardstick of one who denies the very existence of God, divine miracles in the form of fulfilled predictions exist throughout the Holy Quran as a sign of its truth. So allow me to get into a few examples. And for the first example, I take you to deep space. Allah Ta'ala says, وَالسَّمَاءَ بَنَانَاهَا بِأَدِمْ وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِئُونَ 
and the heaven we built with our own powers, and indeed we go on expanding it. So here in Surah Dariyat, the Holy Quran introduces the concept of the expanding universe. So why is it important to understand this concept? It's important because the expanding universe points to our origins. It answers the question, how did we come to be? So to put it in simpler terms, there are three theories to explain how we, be we began, how the universe started. One, that the universe always existed, that it never had a beginning. Or two, the universe came into being by mere chance, out of nothing. Or three, that the universe was indeed created by a creator, or God. So the first question, did the universe have a beginning? This was answered by a brilliant American scientist by the name of Edwin Hubble in the 1920s. He studied the sizes and shapes of stars and he measured their distances from one another. And he discovered that the universe was much larger than we could ever imagine. And a few years later, he made another discovery that galaxies were actually moving. They were receding over time. And this so-called Hubble constant is based on this discovery that the universe is indeed expanding, just as the Holy Quran had described. So Hubble was able to determine the age of the universe, which is 13.8 billion years old. So the fact that we know the age of the universe means, in fact, that it did have a beginning. And to the second theory, that the universe came out of mere chance, most scientists now subscribe to the so-called Big Bang Theory, as many of you know, in which a singular event led to the creation of the universe. But it was the Holy Quran, quite miraculously, that was the first text to describe this event. Allah Ta'ala says, Avalam yarallazina kafaru annasamavate wal arda kanata ratkan fafatakna huma. Do not the disbelievers see that the heaven and the earth were a closed up mass and then we opened them out. So Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmad, Rahmaullah, describes in his book, Revelation, Rationality, Knowledge and Truth, that the word ratkan used in this verse has two meanings in Arabic lexicon, total darkness and the coming together of things into a single entity. And the subsequent word, fatakna, means to open up, to cleave. And this is precisely the scientific description of a black hole, where a massive collapse of stars leads to darkness. And astronomers, the majority of astronomers, now believe that it was a black hole which was the precursor to the Big Bang, or Fatakna, where there was a massive and sudden release of energy. So Allah Almighty in Surah Anbiya laid out the description of events from 14 billion years ago, which only now science is presenting as the prevailing theory. Now this had a profound effect on one particular individual. There was a woman by the name of Danielle DeLuca. She was a student at Pratt Institute in New York. She was one of those people that was always skeptical of religion. And so she decided to start studying the major revealed texts of various religions just for the purposes of looking for flaws in them. And one day she went to her campus bookstore and she got a copy of the Holy Quran. And as she began reading the Holy Quran, she became subdued, unlike she was with any other text. And when she came across these verses from Surah Al-Anbiya, she was spellbound. She would later go on to say, and I quote, my mind was split asunder when I read this. It was the Big Bang. Suddenly, not just a theory, and I was astonished. It was the most exciting yet frightening time of my life. I read and studied and double-checked book after book until one night I sat in my library at Pratt Institute staring wide-eyed at the pile of books in front of me, and I couldn't believe what was happening. I realized I had in front of me the truth, the truth I had been so sure did not exist." Unquote. So remember those words in Surah Mulk, confused, dazzled, precisely the description of the impact of the words of the Allah Almighty on Danielle DeLuca, and she accepted Islam. And to the final question, what was the inciting event that led to the Big Bang? Science still doesn't have an answer, but the Holy Quran does. As Allah Ta'ala says, muntaha. The Lord is the final of all causes. So let us now come back to Clement and see where he's at in his life journey. 
So he's completed primary school and Clement now enrolls in law school in England. But he decides to leave early and he travels across Europe to discover science and faith. He goes to Egypt, he goes on an archaeological dig up the Nile River, he goes to Syria, he goes to Palestine and Jerusalem, and he is introduced to various religions, one religion after another. He is then invited by some Mormon missionaries and he promises those missionaries that he will go to their holy city called Salt Lake City in Utah. So he takes the journey and it takes him one year by, by boat and he lands in San Francisco and then he goes by carriage to Salt Lake City and he meets Mr. Brigham Young. But Clemens' journey across the world still left him unfulfilled. So then he decided to go to Australia. There he took up a passion for meteorology and in a very short period of time he got worldwide, worldwide fame for scientific contributions. But yet Clement was still yet to be enlightened. And again, remember Clement's story, we will come back to him again. So let us go to the second example of modern discovery. And from the telescope I will take you to the microscope, to the field of embryogenesis or the development of the human being in the womb. The microscope wasn't invented until the 16th century. So for thousands of years, we had no insight into what happens to the human during development. Until, that is, modern science finally caught up with what was already revealed in the Holy Quran 1400 years ago. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Zumar, Khalkam min ba'de khalkin fi zulamatin salasa. He creates you in the womb of your mother's creation after creation in threefold darkness. And further, in the Holy Quran, Allah Ta'ala gives even more description of embryogenesis in much more detail. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse 14, Allah Ta'ala says, Summa khalakna nutfata alakatan fa khalakna alakata muzgatan fa khalakna muzgata izaman fa kasona izama lahma summa ansha'na ho khalkan akhara fa tabarakallahu asanul khalikin. Then we fashion the sperm into a clot. Then we fashion the clot into a shapeless lump. Then we fashion bones out of the shapeless lump. Then we clothe the bones with flesh. Then we developed it into another creation. So blessed be Allah, the best of creators. Asalaamu Alaikum, welcome back. There are new refugees settling in Master 10 and they are facing some challenges in their life. And many thanks to Red Cross and for youth and kids who wants to study helping them to enroll for school, colleges and universities. Thanks to all our viewers and listeners who were able to join us today. If you have any question or comment, please feel free to reach out to us on phone number 0800-9475-26 or email info at the rate mdr.org.nz. Wassalam.